All right, so this video update is for those Forex traders. So I apologize to those, uh, those crypto traders that don't know anything about Forex trading or are not really that interested, but I urge you guys uh, to also watch this video as well uh, because it is a different investment field um, and I talk about it in a, in a way that n not a lot of people are uh, in the hopes to uh, have individuals start thinking outside the bo a box to have a profitable edge. Now what I do right now uh, with my Forex trading is I'm able to profit anywhere from 10 to usually 15% per month at my current broker. Um, and you know that's a lot less than, than crypto trading, but it's also how I'm trading I feel is a lot more secure and a lot safer. Um, so anybody that's uh, wanting to branch out into different areas of investing, I urge you to watch and uh, look into what I talk about here. Okay, <clears throat> so it's been in, uh, since the 22nd of January that I did, did la my last update. And uh, some has happened, um, but I'm also going to get into uh, not just the trades but uh, that, that were taken during that time period, uh, but some other serious issues. Uh, some questions were asked on my uh, Forex thread on Forex Factoring. Uh, that I want to bring up in the in this video series uh, because I find them to be very uh, important to how I trade and how uh, you should potentially be looking at uh, doing your trading um, and that has to do with optimization of your strategy and how your strategy has worked in the past and how it may uh, work and continue to work in the future because there's a, maybe a bit of discrepancy there because if your strategy works in the past we don't necessarily know if it's going to work in the future because the past isn't always copied. Um, and so that's how we know the market is always changing, just like the crypto markets are always changing as well. And so it's really hard to, uh, and sometimes really hard to trade the market when it's always one step ahead of us. So let's get into the trades. Uh, what has happened uh, with my trading? Uh, and what's closed out so far, and what I and where I currently am. Uh, so you see, let me shrink this down a little bit. Actually, no, this one here. You can see that I'm in a a few trades now. <clears throat> uh, I'll talk about the current trades in a second, but I'm going to get into the ones that were already taken uh, since my last video update. So let's scroll back a little bit, and this is on the Oanda account. Uh, let's just scroll down so you can actually see. Uh, the 117,324. So this is not a small account. Uh, it's also not a really large account uh, when it comes to you know some of the big multi-million dollar accounts. But when it comes to the retail trading space, most accounts are under the 10,000 mark. Uh, so I guess you could still categorize this as a larger account. Okay, so the first trade, you see the inside candle there and after the push up. Now this was a, a pretty good entry too. Um, it wasn't near any whole number. It was it was pretty close to the 76 level, but it wasn't quite close enough. Um, so I don't I don't see that as a whole number uh, reversal right here. But it was still a good uh, a good indication after a big candle right here, this big candle, and then an inside candle right after a small inside candle, uh, a bearish inside candle. So this is my two candle setup. <clears throat> It pushed down. So what what happened? What I'm looking for is a slowing of the initial push up in the momentum. Uh, and so I look for price uh, places in price uh, having to do with the candlesticks that show me that uh, that a potential slowdown of that push in that initial direction is is slowing. Um, you know, you can see here <clears throat> that there was a small push down, right? I don't. There wasn't any indication, at least with my strategy or my setup. That was showing me that showing me that there could be a, a reversal early on. Now there are, are some hints with the candlestick that happened after, in particular this one here, uh, that could show some a downward push. But I'm looking at just a two-bar setup here. So these two candles. I'm going to zoom in just a, a little bit so you can see a little bit better what I'm talking about. <coughs> inside. So the, the, I mean this is not the inside candle, but this is the uh, the candle set up, and then I need to wait for the inside candle to close. And the inside candle has to be, the wick has to be inside the previous candle, and then I enter on the opening of the next 
uh, of the opening of the next candle. I need to make sure that this inside candle actually closes inside because sometimes it can it can be uh, shaping up to be inside, but uh, in the last couple of seconds it can flip up and not be an inside candle, which is not a signal uh, for me. So initial entry went down, and I'm looking for uh, roughly 50 to 60 pips here. Uh, moved down only 28 and then pushed back up. So I'm going on a grid here and uh, so I'm looking at, at the next order which is 20 pips away here. So 20 pips, second order goes in and then 20 pips later third order goes in and then the reverse will happen. So now that one actually happened right near the whole or round number at 76 uh, which is good and as I've said before that near the round number, the round numbers uh, typically hold some natural support and resistance. Now it's not always the case, but in uh, in a lot of different scenarios, it, they do offer some natural support and resistance uh, because it's natural flow of orders that go in at, around or near these levels. So usually I'm looking for price anywhere from 20 to 30 pips above or below these round numbers because they of the, that natural support and resistance that's shown there. Okay, so right at the, basically at the peak, of my third order, it fell, and so that's why I'm looking. That's why I do this grit trade, this grit trading, and um, automatically once my first order enters, uh, there is potential for a a pullback on the downside. You can see that this, since this is red, I'm looking for a sell here, push down, and didn't quite move enough of what I needed it to move. Push back up, and that's when I entered these other three positions, looking for that eventual pullback, and it did happen. I was able to close out all my trades for a total of 50 pips. Now, for those of you that doesn't don't don't know what a 50 pips is, uh, I'm not going to explain it here. Just look it out, look it up online, and you'll you'll figure it out. It's a lot like points in the stock market. Um, it's just a kind of a different terminology. Okay, so the second uh, basket was only actually one trade, and this one was pretty good. Uh, so I was able to capture the peak or near the peak up here before it fell down. And I know that, that it fell down a lot more than my initial take profit. It went up again and then fell even further. But I'm taking my, my profit in, in running. I don't want to try to extend this. Uh, that's not part of my strategy. If I'm, I take my profit and I'm happy with what, what I get. So this moved down, made another, another extreme level with my arm, RMI, as you can see here, and gave me a really nice another uh, two bar inside candle setup. And this one was pretty cool because this bearish candle that you see here is an indecision candle. It has looks kind of like a tootsie roll upside down, <laughs> and it has the wicks, almost the even wicks. And <clears throat> so that candle is kind of an indecision candle in itself, and then followed by an inside candle uh, was a really powerful signal. And you can see here that my entry was on directly on the next candle in, uh, open, and it moved up and gave me about 54 or so pips, I think. That was about 50 pips. Um, and uh, closed out for profit. <clears throat> and, you know, the, these are not huge trades. Are, uh, on this $117,000 account, 50 pips is giving me about $150 or so. Uh, you know, it's not it's not a small amount, but for 117k, some people might find that a bit, a bit small. But honestly, it's about protecting the 117,000 here instead of trying to make massive amounts of, of profit. Because the more profit that you try to make in any market, not just in Forex, but also in crypto, in any market, the more, more money that you try to make, it always comes along with more risk. That's just how it works. Uh, there are some strategies that you are able to minimize risk and still make larger gains, but there are, are um, negatives behind trying to pull that off, and it's not an easy task, uh, and not many people are, are, are able to do that. But that is the goal. That's the goal that we're always trying to do as, as traders, minimize risk and maximize the po uh, potential gain. And that's what I feel like I've done here, uh, but I always have to uh, revolve around the lowest denominator. That means that the worst possible scenarios uh, of my strategy over the le last 11 years I have to uh, make sure that my strategy is able to work in those really awful conditions. And so uh, it's trades like these that don't give me a lot of, or each, posi each position itself doesn't give me a lot of profit, 
but when combined together, give me a good, nice, steady uh, profit roll with most of the time low drawdown. Uh, but I have to be ready for those really bad times if they if they happen to come along, and so that's why I do my risk in this way to accommodate those worst moments. Okay, <clears throat> so with that being said, I'll come back to that in just a second because that was what my uh, uh, my post on my on the Forex Factory thread was uh, about was a lot about risk and how to develop a a profitable strategy and what works and what doesn't. So the current market right now uh, and where I am with my trades is a push up, push back down, inside, another inside candle setup, two candle setup, entry, first entry, so entry number one, and then uh, the market closed. It went down, I had two more entries I believe, uh, so there were three trades before, sorry, uh, three trades entirely before the market closed. The market closed right on this candle over the weekend and uh, reopened on a gap. Now that sometimes can happen, as you guys know, um, depending on what happens before closing and, and during the weekend, there, there can be a, a large gap um, on, on uh, in price, uh, depending on the pair. So the gap was recovered, pushed back up, didn't quite push back up enough. It was pretty dang close for me to uh, close out for profit, but just didn't just didn't happen, unfortunately, and then shot back down in where we are currently now. Uh, so there is some support uh, here. I'm not sure if it's enough to really push up more, uh, but there is some support that's happening right now. Um, I'm hoping that it will continue up, uh, but it looks like it's a little bit. It's having a little trouble uh, pushing up. It's it's still moving gradually up, but it's having a hard time getting enough volume to really break that uh, the 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 selling that's happening uh, currently. All right, so I also have uh, two trades in on the NZD CAD. Uh, now there wasn't, weren't any open, uh, or there are currently open trades, but there weren't any trades that happened uh, since my last update. It's been pre been pretty quiet on the NZD CAD and Aussie CAD. Uh, but just the two trades here, and you can see where the first entry was. Uh, this was not. This was an inside candle setup here. But as I've told you before, my EA tries to spot the uh, where the last low was, which was here. And so it won't open a trade right here, which is a good thing because it waited till uh, it waited till this one, which was a lot closer. It didn't make a new low, but it was it was closer to the actual uh, last low that happened. So the EA took a, took the position right here, well, just a bit, a bit above, including the spread, uh, to right on this candle right here, and pushed up slightly, went back down, and then pushed up again. And then it's been in, in a kind of a, a range on the way down. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of a pattern. Making new lower lows. And this time, it's kind of getting smaller. As you can see, the, the channel. You can say that it's doing this as well. Hang on, let, me, let me mark this a little bit better. We're kind of shrinking here. Where it's going down. Uh, so what's going to happen? Is it going to is it going to jump off here and then shoot up, or is it going to continue break? Is it going to break down? So when it goes into this tight, tighter, tighter range, uh, it's uh, something is about to happen, where it's going to break out and go down further, or it's going to break out and go much higher. But it's going to break probably out of this 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 small channel here eventually. It just uh, we just don't know when. Okay, so I wanted to do this video to show you guys the current open trades because a lot of times I show you what happens when the trades are uh, exit for profit. But that's not really very interesting, right? Because we want to talk about the trades that are currently in because that's a little bit, uh, you know, there's more motions involved at that point. So you can always say, oh, that well, you know, hindsight is always 2020 and this is what happened. Uh, but it's hard to really know how what the emotions are when you're currently uh, going through either some, uh, a lot of drawdown or some drawdown. You can see here that I'm only in about uh, half a percent of drawdown, uh, maybe just sl slightly more on a $117,000 account. So the drawdown, when we're considering, considering one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven trades there, uh, and then eight and nine trades altogether. So out of nine trades, 
I'm only in a half a percent drawdown. That's actually pretty dang good considering how many open positions that we have. And if this continues up, what's going to happen here is I have uh, made adjustments to my strategy. And this is something that a lot of people just don't pick up on. And I don't understand when when I've all the videos that I've released, um, I try to give away as much information as possible so people can start thinking and using my strategy or thinking in a different way at least to um, help uh, modify their own strategies or even use my my strategy and I do it all for free just uh, to help educate others into thinking in a different way because it's something that I wish that I had uh, starting out in, in Forex trading and well actually just trading in general because this doesn't just this type of trading just it doesn't work just for the Forex markets uh, I found that it also uh, can work for stocks it can work for uh, the cryptocurrency markets as well uh, that it does uh, a good strategy, well at least I think it's a good strategy, does translate into other areas, uh, into other other markets. And the idea here is if I'm using three pairs, which is the Pound CAD, the Aussie CAD, and the New Zealand CAD, I need to figure out how they can both, they can all work together well because there's a problem is that I'm using the CAD on every single of my trading pairs and that a lot of people see as negative because that means that I'm going three times deep into one currency pair. <clears throat> well that is that is somewhat true that I have I'm, I could potentially be in a very a very tricky situation if the Canadian dollar either uh, loses for some reason has a huge crash or um, completely opposite has massive gain uh, that I'll be potentially struggling on all three pairs. Now this is this has come into uh, my back testing and in my optimization of the strategy of my strategy to uh, accommodate this kind of scenario. Uh, so my risk is able to handle uh, if this happens, and it it can be a double-edged sword. I mean, it it can be something that uh, is great for the system and it can be something that is hard to work with. And how I've managed to do this is by uh, minimizing the risk to accommodate three trading pairs on the, that use, happen to use the same currency. And also uh, optimizing in a way that each pair can also complement. And how they complement is because when, for example, let's say all three of them are in drawdown, and if they have that pullback that my system looks for and that pullback is happening, it needs to be only minimal because if that pullback is happening on each of my trading pairs, that means that I can close out the profit much earlier because each of them are moving into a profitable uh, position at the same time. So I don't need to look for a lot of pips on each, sing on each pair because they're all working together as a whole. And this is just something that people don't, are not getting very well. And it's something that a lot of traders don't use in their strategies. They don't, they look at each pair individually and instead of as, as a whole. When, this is why we have so many different pairs and we can utilize them uh, to help accommodate or, or um, accommodate, um, to help complement each other. And that's what I found out is, uh, a, a very key element to trading in this way. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, I'm going to need a bit of a more of a pullback here on that. I'm also going to need the, bit, uh, the pullback uh, on the NZD CAD. We'll see if this bottom support level is able to hold out and this pushes up, but not a lot of action on the uh, Kiwi CAD yet. All right, so let's move on, on to the uh, to the thread at Forex Factory. Now you can read a lot of my whole video series. Uh, I recommend watching my whole video series from the beginning of this thread. I know it's kind of long, it's 43 pages, and I probably have re released, I would guess, maybe uh, 20 or so videos in the course of this time. And I recommend watching them to find out how my strategy works, a lot about the Forex, uh, the Forex trading world, and, um, and what I do to, uh, you know, continue to try to be profitable as a trader. Um, and unfortunately, I did have a loss recently. 
uh, because of emotions tying to manual trading. And that's one reason why I've stepped away from manual trading and continued to work on a Forex trading robot that does the work for me uh, to take the emotions out for one and also my strategy is not really fully capable of being utilized manually in manual trading you can still try to trade it but it's not easy and that's why um, it's necessary for my strategy to be put into an expert advisor or uh, a robot uh, so it can be traded properly and so a lot of people have, have told me well you if you uh, can't be profitable man in manual trading then you're not a true trader that's not true because there are so many different uh, managers or, or traders out there uh, or even institutions now are starting to look into algorithms um, and, and robots and auto trading as a good way to trade the markets because it, they can uh, robots can do things that humans cannot I mean obviously we can do things that robots can't but there are certain types of positives and negatives for both and for me expert advisor robot trading works the best uh, because it's able to take advantage of a, t of a strategy like this. All right, so <clears throat> the question was that I replied to was right here. I also did a lot of back tests, and to be honest, on some occasions, a large loss was just avoided by a few pips of price movement. When comparing back tests to those at Ryan's uh, my FX book, uh, my FX, uh, book page, which looks like over-optimization to me, so I think one should be aware that even though this strategy might be profitable in the long term, it's still risky and, and you should expect to get the maximum possible loss from time to time, hopefully only every few years. So good things and bad things here, but he brings up a really good point. And this is something that has been frowned upon uh, from other, uh, other few users regarding my strategy is the idea of over optimization. So what does that mean exactly? And I, I go into it here, you can read this here, and, but I'll just try to uh, paraphrase a little bit of what I said here. Uh, the, the fear of optimization, this is basically when you force previous price to fit into a pre, into predefined EA settings. And remember EA is a robot. Uh, it stands for Ex Expert Advisor, so it's just short for that. In turn, this means you can basically find the golden settings to make your strategy fit a cookie cutter mold to previous price. So it's basically where if you have 11 years of back history, uh, history from you know 2007 or 2008 on to, to now, then you optimize your expert advisor to fit that data. Uh, and there are strategies that are able to do that. Um, and most people don't find that very helpful because what has happened in the past won't necessarily be repeated in the future. But it's how you you view that data and how your expert advisor is optimized to that data. And how are you optimizing that expert advisor to fit that previous data? And are you looking, looking at it objectively or uh, subjectively? How are you approaching that data? Uh, you could technically say that uh, this is what I've done in my system, and you know, okay, so forcing a strategy EA to, to pre, uh, fit previous price is looked at by most as negative, but this is because, uh, technically uh, means that the strategy EA could fail at any given moment in the future. That's, you know, that's the big reason why people don't like uh, over optimization because it means that your strategy can fail at any moment. <clears throat> but isn't that the key to to trading? Is that everything that we're using, every tool, every indicator every manual or price action technique is based on on what's happened previously what to, to make sense of what we're using we have to look at previous data and all these indicators that we're currently using were based on previous price data to help us in attempt to help us give, give us an edge <clears throat> and so even though people are saying oh well over optimization in previous data is such a negative thing Aren't you guys you doing the same thing with your indicators, your expert advisors, all that kind of stuff as well? I mean, some people like to say that, oh, my expert advisor is able to adapt to the market by uh, using a trailing stop and, um, and reading the markets and how, they're, and how they're adjusting 
uh, by having not a, a cookie cutter set of, of rules that my expert advisor uh, follows. But there's still a lot of dangers with that because if your expert advisor, uh, it tries to grab too much data, then is it able to really adapt when it can't really capitalize on each moment, on each type of trading, uh, if, it, if the market's trading in range, if it's trading in trend, uh, if it's flat, is it really able to, to capture those moments? I mean, that's, that's the big question. I mean, I'm sure that there are some expert advisors out there that are able to grab off a huge chunk of every single market, but it's not an easy task. So my, my settings are maybe could be technically looked at as, as more cookie cutter because they do fit into a mold. I have a, a, I have a set to take profit of 50 pips, for example. A lot of people frown upon that because they think, well, why don't you have a trailing stop? Because that means that you can, you can take a lot more pips per, per order uh, or, or less as well. And I, I have disagreed with people on this because I found that in my testing, even though I have have uh, a trailing stop on pretty much every expert advisor that I own, which is over the hundreds now, uh, to try to capture this idea that uh, an adaptive EA is the best way to go by having settings like a trailing stop. Just as an example, I'm not saying that uh, this is the best adapt uh, adaption or adaptive way I can I can modify an EA is by just changing the trailing stop. There are much more other there are many more uh, many more settings that you can do to make an EA adapt. Um, but a set take profit is for me the best way to go because if you have a trailing stop, that means that you're taking less pips on a lot of trades and you're taking potentially more trip, uh, pips. What's the benefit of that? Because in the end, it's going to equal out to be either uh, the same. Uh, that pips uh, 50 pips that I'm taking, or or potentially even less, because the market is it, it ranges more than it, it actually uh, moves in, in in a trending kind of way, and so because of that reason, a trailing stop typically takes less pips because of that. At least in my understanding, in my strategies, it it typically has taken less less pips than 50, and so that's why I feel like 50 pips is a good steady medium ground for my strategy when it comes to uh, the take profit levels. Okay, so I've pulled over, I go into uh, reasonings here, I've pulled over 11 years of data uh, on each of my trading pairs to see how, how my strategy has worked over the uh, over the years of time. Now that, that's a really important thing because you have to see uh, how well your strategy has behaved over over years of data. You need to make sure that your strategy at least can have, like is profitable for three to five years. And that's a good starting point. Because if it hasn't been profitable to for three to five years, how can you trust it to be profitable for the next six months? I mean, you could say that if it's profitable for 11 years, like mine is, how do I, how do I know it's not gonna be profit, it's gonna be profitable for the next six months? Well, it, there are problems with that, but the longer, I feel like the longer, the more data that I can pull, the better off I am for future, uh, for future, future price action or, or or price data or you know price movement. And I'll get into more of that in just a second. Uh, see if I can understand how and why my strategy fits and, and works price so well during these 11 years. So it's um, about sorry, I'm just checking to see how long I'm going. It's about trying to see uh, how understand why my prof my strategy is either profitable or not profitable. A lot of times people, when they test strategies, they look into them and say, oh, well, it's not profitable, so I'm just going to throw it away. No, don't. you should try to see why it's not profitable, where it's taking its trades, why uh, it's failing. And so the understanding these questions can really help you figure out how to better make your strategy or to really just be a better trader. How many times in these 11 years was my strategy close uh, to loss or blowing up. And those are the moments, these are the key moments to your strategy, is finding the worst possible moments, either you know when it has a losing trade or when it is close to having losing trades and dissecting what happened in that, in that uh, uh, place of price or that time period. What was going on in the market? If was there news involved? Uh, was there a crash in the stock market or a recession? Uh, what was happening to really cause this uh, this type of behavior, and 
what can you do as a trader to improve or to safeguard yourself from these uh, potential uh, big catastrophe, catastrophe moments. <clears throat> That's what I, what I get into next on step four. When and where were these losses uh, or close losses? Um, so you got to dissect why your strategy is doing what it's doing. Uh, and again, it comes back to understanding how it works or, or why it works. How to appropriately modify my strategy to help it better avoid uh, avoid drawdown and potential loss like uh, like this uh, losses well I should have said potential losses like this in the future so I'll make that change um, later on and so the understanding uh, where and when these losses happen will pretty much answers the question or helps you answer the question uh, of five and how can you better accommodate uh, those potential losses. What adjustments can I make to complement my trading pairs individually and together? Uh, this step did not include optimization. Now, this might be, this step didn't include, uh, did not include optimization. There might be, that might be up for interpretation, um, which some people might comment on. Uh, but this is, includes me uh, making a second expert advisor to help my original expert advisor better adapt to future price. And now this second expert advisor I've mentioned to you guys in, in some of my past videos, uh, it helps to uh, allow my all of my pairs to work together. <clears throat> and uh, I don't think I have it pulled up right now. But it's an expert advisor that helps close out trades. It helps close out trades when an overall profit is met, something I was just speaking about just a few minutes ago. And it uh, helps also... Uh, if something bad happens, I can close out all my trades in a, percent, a percentage loss or a pip loss as well. Um, so I am better protected for uh, future uh, the future market uh, when it comes to either taking profit or having to eventually take a loss. Because, you know, eventually I'm going to probably be hit with some losses or lost. I, lost I'm hoping that it's not uh, a really huge catastrophe. Uh, but I try to prepare for these moments, these bad moments, as best I can. Um, and so that I'm always constantly imp trying to improve uh, this in my strategy. The hope of understanding of each pair's behavior and personality over time. Now this is actually pretty key. Um, and, and what has helped me, actually what started me down this path, is maybe I could figure out the personality behind a, uh, an expert advisor. Oh, sorry, not an expert advisor, a personality behind a, uh, a currency pair, for example, like the pound Canadian dollar. Maybe if I went through tons of data, I could figure out how long it's trending for, how long it's ranging for, um, what kind of price action techniques work best on this pair over a 11 year span of time, uh, how often uh, is it volatile, how often is it... Uh, uh, kind of dead in the market, um, and or a flat, you know, is what they typically call it. And it's these kind of things that help me understand or help me build a strategy to accommodate a, a type of personality pair like this, a, a the pound CAD that has that has had a personality over the last 11 years where it's um, either uh, trending a certain amount of time during this period. Or it's ranging uh, for this year or years uh, mostly, and what percentage of that uh, it, uh, is taking place? It's those kind of things that that help you understand uh, and help you better develop a strategy for a given currency pair. <clears throat> so exploring this helps understand my EA's worst uh, EA's worst moments, so I can better optimize it uh, for potentially the worst market conditions. That includes news. Uh, like uh, or, or, or news announcements, not just news announcements, but also big news events um, like Brexit, for example. That was huge. And my expert advisor was able to make it through um, that uh, the Brexit without you know having huge losses. Um, and so if I can s develop something that is able to make it through massive, massive news events like that, then maybe I can... Uh, uh, develop and optimize my strategy to accommodate these kind of events in the future. And so that basically goes into my step nine. 
uh, where uh, if I can pull as much data from these 11 years uh, that uh, and optimize my EA for these moments, these worst moments, uh, maybe I can uh, survive. And I say survive because, uh, you know, that's what we try to do as traders is to protect our accounts. And um, and hopefully I am able to, my, my expert advisor is able to adapt and the settings are good enough to work with future market behavior on my specific pairs. Even if they are changing on a daily basis, hopefully they're staying, they're changing in a way that uh, happened uh, or they're somehow moving in a way that is similar to the way they were moving in, say, for example, 2013 for a month or two. Uh, the market currently is moving like it did back in 2013 uh, where it had a, a span of two to three weeks where it was moving in a very similar way as it is now. And so that's what I mean by personality is taking something, its behavior from past data in hopes that, in hopes that it will somehow be similar to its current market uh, price movement. So how important is risk in step, te step 10? How important is risk in developing a strategy like this? How much of a factor do the worst moments in 11 years play on risk? Now that, that is another key element to my strategy, and I've talked about it already a little bit when I had the charts up, and that is to uh, change my risk settings to accommodate the worst possible market conditions in those 11 years. So if my drawdown was, for example, or my, my testing in 11 years crashed uh, or blew up, because of a something that happened in 2013, then I need to adjust my settings to uh, to withstand that 2013 uh, problem, and and hopefully adjust it to um, w my risk to accommodate that problem without taking a massive um, potential losses on my account. And you know these these occasions may happen again, uh, where I am struck with with massive drawdown or you know too many trades open, and it's just you know, I it's the unknown. How can I? Um, this is the best way I feel like to me to prepare for those moments in a strategy, because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. As traders, we try to best prepare by developing a strategy that we think that uh, uh, that in either includes a lot of discretion, which discretion is a very powerful tool in trading, or a strategy that in pulls a lot of data or something in combination. <clears throat> and discretion can be hit or miss, and that's, discretion is very hard to um, modify a strategy to work because you're idea of trading is, is constantly being modified by taking different positions. That's what discretion can be a, a, a good thing or it can be something that's really bad because you can be making very poor decisions based on a very tricky market condition. So in the end, I say real, the reality is no trader is completely protected no matter how great of a trader they are or a uh, strategy they have. We know the forex market is changing on a daily basis. It's known. It's a known fact that I'm prone to future price movement because it's a unknown. It's the unknown. But so is every single trader or institution. The question is, how much of an advantage do I really have optimizing my strategy in EA this way? I think it's huge. Optimization needs to be looked at objectively, and this is. And this, I believe, is my is my edge. So. I don't. Sorry to read everything. I'm sure you guys probably, since I've been talking about this, we're, we're reading everything yourself. Um, but I don't know how effective what I have will be for probably another few years, and I'm never going to be protected. There's nothing I can do to uh, protect myself from from losses. I can minimize losses uh, by uh, constantly updating and uh, trying to minimize my risk and maximize my profits. 
but I'm always going to be uh, prone to having uh, substantial losses in the future, just like everybody is. And and, and this goes for even those discretion discretionary traders as well, that emotions can come in and they can hold on to a position too long uh, or cut it too short, and you know you can have unfortunate losses. So this is what I've been. This is what my series is all about. So I feel like this is probably one of the most important videos that I have released in any of my videos uh, videos so far, uh, at least in the last year, uh, because it goes into a lot of the detail on what what to look for and why I've gone down this route. Why I've gone this down down this route as a as a trader, uh, and why I think it's important to do so. Because initially everybody's thinking is, well, if you develop a strategy like this, then you're going to, it's going to kick you in the butt later on. Yeah, it could it could do that, uh, you know. But I feel like the longer I can continue to stay profitable, uh, the better off. I know the more confidence, let's say the more confidence I have with this trading uh, technique or strategy. And you know, previous data is all we have to go off of. And I don't, I feel like not enough traders use enough data to really develop their strategies, um, because, in, because in my reality, I I feel like the more years that we can grab as data in data, the better off we'll be in the future. All right. Well, that's pretty much it for for me today, guys and gals. And um, I hope that you watch this video to the end. I know it's a little bit long, um, but I will continue to talk more about these things in the future. But if you wanted to watch one video on my, uh, about my forex trading, this should be the the video. Um, if you have any questions or comments, if you liked what you heard here, please give me a thumbs up and. Hopefully you, hopefully you continue to subscribe or subscribe now. And I'll release more videos regarding uh, Forex trading because that's where my focus is going to continue to lie. I know that you've seen me in crypto trading, but my crypto trading uh, is likely to come to an end very soon here because the market is becoming a lot harder to read uh, and the market is currently changing too. Uh, you can see that the, the crypto bubble has popped uh, and I feel like a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies, in, in, in particular the altcoins, will suffer. Uh, it's just like the dot-com era, era when they all released that, and a, a lot of the smaller companies died out because and, or went bankrupt. I feel like that's what's going to happen with the cryptocurrency market. A lot of the little guys will won't make it, uh, but Bitcoin will always be there. So if there's any crypto trading for me, it will be likely in Bitcoin. All right. That's it for this time. Hope to see you guys on the next video, and have a great week. Bye.